Ago, a House Joint Subcommittee began 10 days of hearings into events at Waco, Texas in the spring of 93. The primary witness Tuesday was Attorney General Janet Reno. are reconvened and apparently we have no more votes this evening so consequently we should be able to expeditiously with good favor let you uh, go very shortly Madam Attorney General but we've got a few more questioners Mr. Boyer you're recognized for five minutes thank you uh, Mr. Chairman I don't mean to dwell uh, on the, the uh, issues of the HRT but indulge me if you would please ma'am the, uh, uh, in your statement on pages five and six, as you went over to give some examples of, of the steps that were taken, uh, you have directed the FBI to improve your capaci our capacities to respond to complex hostage and barricade incidences in the future. When, uh, uh, when the FBI moved in with your tanks and assault vehicles on April 19th, did, did you recognize this as some form of a hostage or barricade incident those terms have those terms have been used I at that point I didn't think that there were hostages there I think it was a situation barricade however you want to call it where they weren't coming out Do, I, I recall by the uh, reading the statement of the military advisors that were there one of them had said that, that they couldn't really grade the tactical plan because it was so different than anything that they had ever experienced. Because it was neither an assault uh, nor was it a rescue of a hostage situation. Which leaves me with the impression that this is an arrest. That was made very clear in the discussion because what we were faced with, if it were a military situation, you from your military experience would know you'd go in and uh, there would be an attack, an, an attack in different forms perhaps. But here there was a situation where we had a clear regard for the human life involved. We wanted to affect the ultimate arrest of David Korsh. We wanted at least to try to get the children out in a measured increase of, of pressure through the use of gas that would at least try to get him to, to release the children so that we could deal with it. So it was a situation that the military didn't confront, hadn't right. confronted. Well, the reason I asked that question really was for clarification because when I read this, I don't want there to be left the impression here that perhaps you thought this was a hostage or barricade situation. So I'm glad you uh, have corrected that because I think a lot of the questions deriving on the issues of should you have waited and what that means and the implications really goes to the fact that it, that it was not an in extremist situation. A and uh, I think that's extremely important. One thing. Uh, um, I also uh, want to make is uh, there is a you did reach out to many different individuals for for uh, views one in particular uh, a, a uh, Dr. Dietz uh, I noticed his memo to uh, to Mr. Jim Wright it was interesting because he gives a rather straightforward uh, analysis of the negotiations and this is dated April 17th and he really, he, he said his bottom line was, I don't believe negotiating in good faith would resolve the situation as it now stands. But I thought it was really interesting that he pointed out that he thought that the, really the FBI standing shoulder to shoulder with BATF undermined uh, some of the things the negotiators were doing. He also had pointed out that some of the other negotiating strategies were undermined by other ancillary actions, for example, uh, efforts to gain trust were undermined by the continuing presence of the VATF in a variety of irritants and provocations, whether it be military vehicles, the noises such as the killing of the rabbits and loss of electricity. Another is the appeal to his religious delusions were undermined by use of rational arguments and overt skepticism towards his claims. Another was the quid pro quo deals were undermined by repeated double dealing. Another was the efforts to undermine his authority and irritate Koresh and his followers were undermined by simultaneous treating Koresh and his leaders, allowing him access to legal advice, and it went on. One thing I thought was pretty interesting was at the very end, he said, he talks up, the, he brings up the fact about the press. 
The press will, will focus increasingly on the cost of the operation and beginning asking questions about the White House, the White House role in the operation and the expense and how it's justified. I think we have to be really upfront here. And one thing that, that I do when I sit on the National Security Committee and end up making a lot of important decisions is sometimes you have to separate yourself as a legislator and say, if you were in the Oval Office, what would you do? And I think I, some of my colleagues have, have been hard, perhaps on the President, saying that, that uh, geez, you made the decision to approve, didn't you? Well, I'm, I'm glad they finally have come out and said, yes, I did. But you know what? If I were sitting in the Oval Office, I would sure want to know what's going on. And I would want to be informed as much as possible. And, and, and if, in fact, you had to come to me to make the approval decision, it would, it would be done. I think that's extremely important. The last comment that I, that I have uh, to make is that I don't think that you should be judged harshly on whether you waited or the, the time sequence here, should you wait or shouldn't have you waited, and, or because that you waited for 51 days, it somehow uh, shows a lack of leadership or that type of thing. You know, Ma'am, I do respect you. And, and, and the idea of law enforcement, just it's not like the bell rings and, and the fire truck has to go out because there are a lot of parameters and things you have to take into account. So I think that, that deferred decisions uh, uh, temporarily while waiting for a change in circumstances to help make up one's mind is normal for the rational mind and is not a sign of weakness. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's a sign of strength and it's important to cultivate uh, a belief in one's infallibility. And, and uh, Apostle Paul said it, let all things be done decently and in order. And I think you exercised judgment. It was very difficult, but you exercised that judgment. And I think these hearings have been very helpful to me as a legislator as we move to the ultimate questions of what are the legitimate purposes of government, agencies and their interactions, and how do we seek to resolve these issues. And I look forward to working with you because Thank I have you. to ask the questions, what is the future of the BATF? Thank you very, very much. I'd, I'd like to, to go back again because I think you highlight in the memorandum, and this is one of the, the memorandum that I saw as I tried to prepare, and it was through this memorandum, I, as I recall, that I basically learned of the tension that had existed early on at the, at the time before I came into office. It was this memorandum that prompted us to make sure that there was nothing we could do at that point to go forward, and that I, the reason I asked Webb Hubble, I, I, actually we had heard about this and he had summarized it, but it was the, this concern as expressed in this memorandum, because it's the memorandum of April the 17th. But what, what is clear here is the need to develop what I think we have developed through the Critical Incident Response Group, the capacity of negotiators and tactical people to work together as a real partnership. This is a great tool, a learning tool. Thank you. Well, Mr. Booyer, your time is up. Uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, do you wish to go now? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Attorney General Reno, I think that as we close out these hearings, the one thing that we can all conclude in addition to our acknowledgement of the loss of life, is that democracy cost. Uh, it cost in decision making and balancing the rights of security uh, versus constitutional rights. Let me acknowledge uh, right off that I applaud your earlier statements regarding your affirmation of the value and the necessity of the exclusionary rule. And that is that you've utilized it as a prosecutor, you've seen law enforcement utilize it and you view it as valuable to have an objective intervener, uh, as I've had to be uh, as an associate municipal court judge reviewing search warrants to make decisions that would hold up in court. And I only need you to give a yes or no that that is a valid tool and the protection of the exclusionary rule under the Fourth Amendment is valid. Is that my understanding what you had said earlier yes. to Mr. Scott's question? That's, that's correct. I'd like then to pursue uh, this whole question as we close of giving comfort to the American people of how we strike a balance that results in democracy. I remember the passion that I experienced in protests of some of the Black Panther trials when in New Haven, Connecticut, it seemed that all the streets were filled with National Guard. We left there as young people, however, safe and secure we were protesting the rights of someone to have a fair trial. 
At the same time, I remember being appalled at reading the tapes of the COINTELPRO that resulted in the siege, if you will, on many civil rights leaders in the 60s and 70s, particularly in the 60s dealing with Dr. Martin Luther King, and the Senate hearings thereafter that indicated that there should be some restraint on the Federal Bureau of Investigation. So it is to point out that all of us bring a sense of history to these hearings. I, as an African American, and some others with other experiences, we bring these experiences to the table. I would hope that as we look at conclusions, and I want to go back to your conclusions uh, that you had in your opening statement. Um, and before I do that, let me acknowledge that my questions earlier when I was reading did come from this uh, document, which was the summary report or summary documentation that you utilize in your decision making. And you answered my question by saying this was one of the sources. Uh, but you raised uh, an issue uh, that I think is important. We didn't understand the Branch Davidians, uh, what they believed in. There wasn't a lot of belief. They were not a distinct organized church body as some would like to have associated with a church body that exists today that has more of a world humanitarian effort. Do I understand, however, that part of the solution that you're offering is to increase the utilization of behavioral scientists uh, and crisis resolution centers so that we can be sensitive to the many myriad of groups that are in this nation that deserve protection under the Constitution. And I'd appreciate it if your answer would be brief, only because my time is limited. Okay. Yes. Can I also uh, cite as an example of a modification or improvement an enhanced SWAT team uh, so that possibly in this instance, and you made a very good point, you said we're here today and you don't know if we as congresspersons would have made decisions based on what we are learning or what we're reviewing. But you indicated that uh, this would, uh, that one of the sources of uh, responses would be a SWAT team uh, possibility increase or enhancement and that they might have been able to be utilized. And let me follow up my question as my time is going. Would you also comment on your involvement or understanding of military involvement because of the American people's sensitivity to that? And lastly, do you think it was a good decision to allow the attorneys, the defense attorneys, to go in uh, and to be involved but then have their response uh, commenting that the government agents acted improperly or were too quick to act? I would hope that as you answer these questions, we can reinforce our belief and desires to be able to support democracy and as well to represent or to recognize that we all have different viewpoints and have suffered or benefited the burdens and the benefits of being an American citizen. And in order to have that value and that virtue and that benefit, we must experience law enforcement as well as the Constitution equally together. If you'd answer those three questions, I'd appreciate it. With respect to the military, we're, we're very sensitive to that issue. We looked at it and I wanted to make sure that we, I asked about the tanks and how we got them and learned that we had uh, entered into an arrangement with the military whereby we leased them under a, a memorandum of understanding or a contract of some sort so that the military was not involved except in terms of maintenance and it was to provide the protection. But I have always been extraordinarily sensitive to the posse comitatus requirements based on my experience in South Florida where we constantly had to determine how we could rely on the military and, and how we couldn't and how important it was and so I, I share that concern and we continue to review that. With respect to the attorney being permitted to go in, as has been pointed out, this was an extraordinarily unusual step but I think it was a step taken to try to explore every avenue to try to come up with something and I think they tried to build on that. Chairman McCollum had asked me about it, trying to build, trying to show some indication that he was this time for real. And the third point, as I mentioned earlier in, in my opening remarks, the FBI is working with uh, both Michigan State University and George Mason University to develop the capacity uh, to understand. I think that is one of the great challenges that we face in this country today. I see community policing at work because people are understanding and developing an understanding of the community they serve and the people they work with. I see the FBI reaching out in so many different ways now 
to affect a relationship with the community, to understand the community, to better serve the community. I think one of the great challenges of law enforcement and why it is such an extraordinary profession, such a critical profession, is how does it protect its people while at the same time ensuring their rights and we are dedicated to trying to do that, and I am, have a great respect for the direction that Director Free has taken. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Here's Chairman, the there was a, another question that I I'm beg sorry. your indulgence, and I know that I ran them all quickly. It was the question of the SWAT team with the idea oh, that yeah. that may have been able to save the children, or maybe CSKS Clear. would not have been able to use. You might want to explain yeah. that, but you'd recommended an increased SWAT team. You, uh, what? What is I, what I, as I indicated, what we had was one hostage rescue team that provided the perimeter security. It was supported by local law enforcement, as I understand it, but they had the training, the expertise, and the skill. I was very surprised when I took office and learned of the situation that, to learn that the SWAT teams that the FBI had and that local law enforcement had did not have the training of the HRT so they couldn't be interchanged. This will provide increased an enhancement of the HRT team, but we have also already provided the enhanced training for the SWAT teams that would make them interchangeable. And as I do believe I told Chairman Hyde, what I would do now without that concern is I would have interchanged or the director of the FBI would have interchanged the teams and we would have waited longer to see what might have happened. What the final outcome would be, no one will ever know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Thank Jackson. You. Mr. Klinger, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Again, uh, Attorney General Reno, we thank you for your long day with us. And uh, I think as we close, uh, come close to the end of these uh, series of hearings, uh, we're all attempting to figure out what lessons we can draw from uh, what happened, uh, what steps we can take, or what steps perhaps we shouldn't take uh, in the future to ensure that we don't have it again. And I think uh, you deserve uh, credit and praise for undertaking to do some things within the department, within the Department of Justice, to address things that you feel were uh, brought about by this event. But I want to invite you to look again, as, as I talked earlier this morning, in sort of the broader perspective of inter interdepartmental concerns. I think that the decision making process uh, is clearly critical in these kinds of elements. How do we need to change it, or do we need to change it? Uh, and there's been an awful lot of discussion about the President's engagement or lack of engagement uh, in the decision to go in or in, any, in the decisions that were made with regard to Waco. And your testimony uh, has been that, that you made that decision and uh, that it was your decision and it was based on all of the information you had uh, and that the President concurred in it. That suggests to me uh, some sort of a, a lack of engagement uh, totally. I mean, it was, a, it was sort of a passive agreement with uh, the decision that you had made. You had the benefit of, of having uh, the total briefing and the total exposure to all of the decision. But given the fact that this was the largest uh, you know, law enforcement activity or engagement uh, that anybody can remember, shouldn't the, perhaps the pre shouldn't perhaps the decision have been elevated to that level. I mean, the President has a broader perspective, perhaps with all due respect, uh, a broader perspective of, of what may be involved. And we're talking about uh, serious ramifications that could have flowed from this, that did flow from this. And I guess shouldn't, in my view, that the, his engagement was, was sort of uh, on a very passive level and not directly involved. And I guess um, my sense is, shouldn't uh, this kind of decision be made uh, at the uh, at the president's level, shouldn't he have the ultimate say, and shouldn't he have been exposed to the kind of briefing that you had uh, before that decision was made? I had talked with Chairman Zella earlier, and I don't think that you were in the room. And so, if you were, and I repeat, forgive me and just stop me. But what I tried to explain is, the president may be briefed on on a mission involving the military and foreign policy because he is clearly the commander-in-chief of the military and that is an executive function. Law enforcement is in a way a quasi-judicial function which involves the necessity for independence. As I explained, if there was a congressman and the president was fussing around in that investigation and what was being done and how it was going to be resolved, you'd be irate. And if a congressman called me and tried to pressure me and fuss around in an investigation, we'd all be irate. Right. 
in law enforcement, you have to have an independence to a certain extent if interests of, of the nation are involved. And, and that's the reason I think it was important that he be advised and that we, we have that opportunity to, to let him know, particularly since he had been earlier concerned when he had an acting attorney general uh, from the prior administration. It is a very difficult balance to walk, Mr. Chairman, to retain the independence of law enforcement so that the President, the Congress, are not dictating to the FBI how to do something. And this was a law enforcement operation. I will continue to look forward to the opportunity to work with you on how we draw that line. But it was one that I think he drew quite well. Let me, before my time has expired here, uh, ask one further question. That was to refer to what I said this morning. And that is, my, my concern is that we have two different uh, law enforcement agencies in two different departments, and yet they were involved in a mutual exercise, but reported to different leaders, to different uh, decision makers. And I, I know that you are reluctant to talk about turf battles and so forth, but uh, looking at the broader picture, might it not make sense to have all of the law enforcement agencies that might be involved in these kinds of activities under one leader so that there's no possibility of, of, uh, of confused signals being given? Mr. Chairman, I don't reach out to, for other people's turf. There are times where it would be far easier to coordinate. Uh, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm just asking you to say, might it not be uh, something to be considered? I, I, Any time you can develop a structure that provides appropriate checks and balances but provides better coordination, it's always well to consider it. Thank you. Mr. Klinger, your time has expired. Uh, the gentleman of, of Mississippi wants to reserve his time, as I understand it. Uh, Mr. Coble, you're recognized for five minutes. I thank the Chairman General. It's good to, again, it's good to have you with us. Let me make a few statements, then I'll hear from you in conclusion. Uh, we've been criticized for having these hearings. Oh, they should have been conducted earlier, it's been said. Well, I tried to get these hearings conducted almost two years ago to no avail. Uh, I think they have been useful. Uh, the Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, among others, have editorially uh, endorsed a favorable report on the hearings. So I think some good has come from these hearings. Speaking of turf, Secretary Benson was before us last week, a couple, was well, several days ago, uh, General, and I was disappointed. I thought his attitude was rather cav cavalier. We were discussing a letter that he had received concerning Waco, and the letter was a ticking bomb after the fact, again, applying 2020 hindsight. But he was very casual about it. I think he just dismissed the letter. I don't think he talked to anyone about it. Now, I don't suggest that anybody invade another's turf, but I think it would have been good if he'd picked up the phone and said, Janet or General, I'm in receipt of a letter. There's a, this is laced with potential problems you might want to look at. I'm going to send it over to you. Or con conversely, if you were to receive such a letter that involved another agency, you might want to pick up the phone. Listen, this is, I have no dog in this fight from my shop, but uh, I just received this letter from my staffer, and uh, I think it may warrant your attention. I would hope that would happen during subsequent uh, problems when they rear their heads. Another problem that bothers me, to some extent, I don't think you ordered it, but the order to bulldoze Mount Carmel after the fire. And having done that, evidence was destroyed. Uh, the, we heard several people refer to a missing front door. Well, that could or could not be crucial, but I think it would be at least tangible and, and worthy to examine. Uh, perhaps there was a good reason for the bulldozing, maybe to uh, make it safe or remove a hazard, maybe to destroy evidence, maybe both of those, maybe neither of those. But I think it would be, have been good to have preserved that site, if it could have been done, to have permitted independent arson investigators to come aboard on the ground that so many of our citizens now, and I don't say this critically, General, but so many of our citizens now are wary of the government. I think it would have been beneficial to have had government arson inspectors as well as independent arson inspectors, but that was pretty well nullified by the bulldozing having been done. Having said all that, with what little time I have left, I'll be happy to hear from you in response. 
my understanding with respect to the bulldozing was that it was done after, and, and I presume it was done with, you have a, a burnt structure like that, it can be unsafe, that it was done for safety reasons, but after the arson investigators had examined it, as I understand it, they were independent arson investigators, independent from the federal government. The problem in just leaving it there is you, for evidentiary purposes, it becomes nothing if you don't maintain the, the security of it, if you don't maintain the facility of it. Uh, but I would be happy to explore any concern you had for the if future. If you would, because it was my, it was my recollection, and I may be wrong about this, but it was my recollection that this was done prior to independent arson investigations. And about the, the other turf, if you, if you, if you cabinet members would feel comfortable extending your tentacles into other areas, I think that would be, I think you could do that inoffensively without, you know, without stealing turf. Well, here's what I have done as I testified earlier. I have reached out to the Treasury Department to establish a more regular working relationship in which we meet to discuss issues of mutual concern. I think it has been very beneficial, and we do that on a regular basis. I, I think open lines of communication, I think there's no substitute for it. The red light illuminates, and that tells me my time has expired. Thank you, General, for Thank having you. been with us today. Um, you're correct, Mr. Coble. Your time has expired. With Mr. Taylor, continue to reserve. Uh, you're recognized, Mr. Micah, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I do want the uh, record to reflect that uh, I have known uh, uh, Janet Reno for many years, uh, served in the state legislature when she was appointed a state's uh, attorney, and always admired and respected uh, the capable job she has done. Uh, this has been a very painful experience for all of us. Uh, you talked about some of the things that haunt you, and I talked about them emotionally, things that haunted me. To review what took place and try to make some sense out of it. I hope you can understand that my concern, uh, Ms. Reno, when on our side of the aisle, we, we had a chance to hear all the experts on CS gas, and then we're given this report at basically the close of business. I never got it till, yes, till yesterday, your briefing report. And on page 40, it does uh, cite that there's been extensive uh, uh, experience in, in looking at the effects uh, on children. And uh, we had, we had uh, not been given that information. I contend that based on the, the flawed information you were given, that you made a decision, and maybe you'd make that same decision again today. But in, in fact, um, this re we did not see this report. I did not see this report, and it was one of the things that I was concerned about. I've also been concerned about looking at where CS gas has been used before. We heard Mr. Schiff talk about any place in the world where gas had been used. I've got copies of the Amnesty International reports. Uh, they never cite uh, any use of gas except uh, as, as uh, was pointed out in one of your reports, not by me, that this, the use of the gas might, uh, might be misinterpreted. Uh, I asked where there are re reports available, and I have information I think that's fairly readily available. This GAO report, it says, Israel use of manufactured tear, tear gas in the occupied territories. I'm, I'm holding a copy of the report here. Uh, and it was requested by Mr. Dellums um, in 1989. Did Dr. Salem by any chance or anyone else make you aware of that report? First of all, sir, I'm advised and I wish your staff would verify that this information, this report, had been provided to the committee for some time. And certainly we... Um, uh, I might respond, we could not find it in the materials till two days ago, but it, and I don't know whether it was provided or not, but it was certainly the, not something we could well, find until your staff... The other thing here, Mr. It, Chairman... It, it is because uh, we have tried every way we know how with, to respond. With due respect, too, also, our side got 40-some thousand pages of material. Uh, 
uh, which were put in a room here, we didn't find out till after the proceedings began well into them that there was an index provided to the minority. And again, uh, we're just trying to get to the bottom of the, the, this, but in the report that I cited here, this report says on page three, uh, and again, Mr. Dellums asked for it, exposure to high concentrations of tear gas in small enclosed spaces for 10 minutes. Now, I I'm gonna say just 10 minutes, that's not there. Let me continue. Is potentially lethal, particularly to infants and children, the elderly and those with respiratory and cardiac disease. Now, uh, again, I, I asked for uh, information. I got this. It's my understanding the only one that you consulted was Dr. Harry Salem. Dr. Salem told us that uh, it, he also said there was limited information available, to be honest. Uh, as opposed to what you got in your briefing report. Would you like to respond? Yes, please, sir. Um, and I've tried so hard to work with Chairman McCollum to make sure that we got you the records that you needed. I discussed with him one evening, uh, making sure that there were, uh, every record was available. He said that there was only one concern that he had had, that we provided it without really organizing it. I don't know whether it's incorrect or not, but I then got a call the next day saying that he had asked his staff to call to, to correct the, the record because we had tried to organize it in the way we had presented it to you. We have tried to do everything we can to make sure you have the records. Yeah. Let me, uh, if I might, if Mr. Mike has finished his comments, to explain the status of this so everybody understands it. I think the Justice Department overall has done a superb job of cooperating with our committees. You provided information we've asked for in a timely manner every time we've asked for it, more so than anybody else. The blue book itself, apparently, which is a, a shorter version of a larger briefing book, uh, was not apparently in and of itself available to us till Friday. You know, why, I don't know. But having examined myself uh, some ex to some extent all of these papers over the weekend, we had every document in that blue book you have in front of you, Madam Attorney General, was contained as a part of a larger briefing book about yay big, literally, I, I don't want to exaggerate, but about that big, uh, with a red cover on it, uh, and it has been excerpted. There's not a single item that I know of in the blue book that wasn't in it. We did have that, and we've had that for some time, but I think there was a lot of confusion because you were given the shorter version to work with, and some people referred to the shorter version, which is what you have in front of you, uh, and we had a lot of confusion about it for a while. That's it. But we've okay. had complete cooperation. I do not want anyone Thank you, to feel sure. otherwise. Um, at this point it, in time... I, I, I don't think I answered his question, though. Well, you, it, please go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to keep you from that, but I didn't want the record not to reflect what I just said. This book was given to me on April the 12th when they first presented the plan. I looked at it, and my first reaction was, what about children? I started asking the questions. They then arranged a meeting with Dr. Salem explaining that he was, so far as they knew and their research indicated, was the con country's foremost toxicologist familiar with CS gas. Uh, he came to the meeting. He had consulted with the pediatrician. He advises, I don't have any recollection of whether he talked to me about the GAO report, but I'm advised uh, that he was familiar with the report. Uh, and. The GAO report, as I'm told, and you perhaps covered it with the experts here, does not determine, make a determination as to whether it's CS gas or CN gas that was involved. Again, we had no record of the CS gas. What we have tried to do with respect to the gas, what we will continue to try to do, is explore every concern that anyone has with the best experts that we possibly can, because law enforcement will inevitably have to rely on CS gas to prevent harm through far more lethal means, and we want to make sure we do it the right way. Your time has expired, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Micah. At this point, I'll recognize Mr. Ehrlich for Thank five you. minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to yield my time, man, but I just have one quick follow-up. Actually, that line of questioning, just getting everything straight, uh, is it your testimony that Dr. Salem had conferred himself with the pediatrician or pediatricians with respect to the propriety of using the CS gas? Is that... My Factual. recollection of my recollection of our meeting on April the 14th at the FBI was that he said he had consulted with a pediatrician. Th thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I will yield the remainder of my time to my friend, colleague, and member of the full committee, uh, Representative Bonham. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Madam Attorney General, I, uh, I, I'm in full agreement with you that your number one concern was uh, uh, the welfare of the innocent children, and I think that's where you should have focused. Now, as far as your decision to approve of gassing the Davidians with the CS gas, Apparently, your selection, and after hearing a little more testimony, was based on Dr. Salem's advice on the report prepared by the British research team that provided testimony to this panel earlier in this hearing. Is that correct? I think that Dr. Salem, would, he would have to tell you what he had based on his reports on. He referred to the, I believe it's referred to as the Hemworth report. Okay. And But he also expressed to me what he had done in terms of trying to find but basically other... you're, you're, uh, you base your testimony off of Dr. Salem I don't base my testimony on Dr. Salem my testimony is that I consulted with Dr. Salem as part of the process to try to make sure that I did everything to ensure that the gas would not be, produce permanent harm to children or was the elderly. Was that the only study you did? That was the person that I talked to I also consulted because okay. they were there at the same time with the All commander right. Part of the British study that uh, was testified here, uh, the that they gave us descriptions uh, of symptoms um, of uh, overexposure of the CS, producing excessive salivation, salivation um, congestion of the nose wall and the pharynx, a feeling of suffocation, and first and possibly second degree burns in, in sensitive people. The report further quotes the U.S. Army Chemical Research and Development Center that they know of no laboratory studies that have ever been conducted with CS that utilized, uh, that have been utilized on children as subjects. They also state that the Army databases contain virtually every study on CS that has ever been conducted by any government or private facility in the world. Knowing that your first concern was for the children, I find it difficult to understand how after extensive, exhaustive research you fail to uncover the following information uh, that I uncovered in, in just one day. A report contained in the Journal of American Medical Association dated August the 4th, 1989 that states, I quote, inhalation and toxico toxicology studies at high levels of CS exposure have demonstrated its ability to cause chemical pneumonitis and fatal uh, pneumonary edema. According to an ear and nose and throat surgeon that I talked to, preliminary edema is caused when the mucous membrane is irritated. It secretes mucus, which in children and infants plugs up the bronchi. They th thus drown in their own saliva and mucus. As soon as the child breathes the fumes, the process begins. Soon after that, the child has little uh, lungs left to breathe and dies. I find it impossible to believe that the most powerful law firm in the country, the Department of Justice, at your disposal, you could not find this information out that I found out in one day with two staff members. Um, I recall you saying that the buck stops here, but this information, this information is here. It wasn't that hard to obtain. I talked to a few doctors. Edema is well known. Uh, the danger of edema and CS gas is pretty well known with just about every physician. So I, I, I can't believe that you did extensive studies on this and didn't come up with the same data that I came up with in, in merely one day. And I can promise you that I could come up with a lot more. So I, I'm, I'm sorry to say, Madam Attorney General, that I, I, I think you failed there. And uh, if, if you care to respond, please do. But uh, I think that it's the responsibility of, of, of the Attorney General to, in cases like this, to research every bit of evidence. And if there is contra evidence, then the error should be on the side of the children. Uh, sir, what we did was to consult with the foremost toxicologist in the country. Subsequently, other people raised the concern. We consulted with other experts trying to pursue 
Sorry. trying to pursue every possible lead, and we will continue to. Thank I'm you. sure if you had this information, you would have questioned the experts when they were here and gotten their responses. I, I understand that, but that's not an answer. I'm sorry. I, I mean, you only talked with Dr. Salem. Uh, my Mr. point is there. I, I'm sorry, sir. There what were several I several people that had this Mr. information, Bono, and that that should have been researched Mr. Bono, before your, they were. Your gassed. time has expired. Uh, Mr. Uh, may I just address that because yes, I yes, think he said I only talked to Dr. Salem and what I've tried to explain is what we have done is any new piece of information has been developed we have tried to pursue it and the experts are still telling us sir after pursuing it and I'm sure if, if you had that information you would have presented it to the experts when they testified before the committee but we will continue to pursue absolutely every lead we can to ensure the use of non-lethal means whenever possible. Mr. Shabbat, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, the, uh, as you know, the Justice Department uh, did a report on this whole Waco incident. Uh, and at page 113 of the report, uh, it says that after the fire, uh, agents searched the buried school bus that served as a shelter and found it to be cool and undamaged. Uh, now, the implication of that passage is that the children uh, could have been safe if they were allowed to go there. Um, were you aware of what we learned yesterday, uh, that the government intentionally gassed and bulldozed debris over the trap door leading to the school bus so as to prevent people from escaping to that area? No. All right. Also, um, Special Agent Jamar testified last week that after CS gas was inserted into the compound, he would have exited in a New York minute, as he described it, uh, as if to suggest that everyone should have expected the Davidians to act accordingly, to basically do the same thing. Um, don't you think this reveals a failure on the part of the agents in the field to recognize how differently Davidians would react uh, as a result of their religious beliefs uh, and their devotion to Koresh, even though obviously the rest of us, it's hard to fathom how they'd had this regard for Koresh with what he was all about. But uh, would you respond, please? The best analysis that, that we had was that the gas was not as effective as we had imagined it would be because of the wind, sir. Okay. But relative to the the, the response of the Davidians and, and marching, you're, so basically what you're saying is there wasn't enough gas in there, or the, the wind blew the gas out of the building, and that's the reason uh, that, that you don't think the Davidians came marching out with, with the children? That's correct. Okay. Um, I, I think many people disagree with that, but, but nonetheless, I, I well, really think Well, if you have any that information the, to that effect, is, uh, it would, of I course, I think one of the key mistakes, really, this. that was made in this whole thing was the fact that uh, it was assumed that the Davidians, despite their rather bizarre religious beliefs in many areas that they would act like reasonable people um, and, and they obviously didn't uh, they didn't come out and and I don't uh, I guess none of us ultimately know why that happened but general let me ask you one final question here um, you told us this morning uh, that you were aware of plans to escalate uh, the gassing and disassembling the house uh, with tanks if the Davidians opened fire uh, after the gassing began uh, now, the Department of Justice uh, report says uh, that you, and I, and I quote, emphasized to the president that the operation was intended to proceed incrementally. Uh, did you also tell the president that the gassing would not be incremental, but would instead be escalated if the Davidians fired on the tanks uh, and uh, the people on the ground knew ahead of time? They thought, in fact, that they probably would be fired upon did you, did you tell the president that, or uh, did you leave him with the belief that the gassing would be incremental even if they were fired on? I gave him the full plan. And may I also suggest to you that the information that's provided to me is that we did not bulldoze the debris over the trap door. Okay, I believe one of the, the testimony yesterday well, was that it was. you might check it out. Okay, I'd, could we, I'd like to follow up after that just and, to make sure. And the, the important thing to understand is is my understanding of what happened in the, of the I think you perhaps he said I immediately started to push the burning debris away from the bus area
Okay. I think we should probably follow up because I don't, I don't have a lot of time If you have any questions left. after you check the transcript, let me know. Okay. We'll, we'll be happy to do that. And there was some testimony about that yesterday, but I think that seemed fairly significant But I think, me. again, what, what, because I keep hearing about this confusion and not having been here or seen the testimony, I would refer you to the record. But the plan was that if they fired, the gassing would occur around the building. What the concern that developed, since they weren't coming out, there was a concern that perhaps they couldn't get out because of barricades. So there was an effort made to, to provide egress from the building. My understanding from the testimony, and again, I think we should check it to make sure that it's absolutely correct, is that one of the supports for that back part was inadvertently hit and knocked down, causing the collapse, but that that was not a part of the planned gradual escalation. That was to occur after 48 hours. Right. That was a different area from the school bus that I was talking about. Mr. Shevich, your, your time has expired. Uh, I believe we only have two more on our side unless others show up. So, Mr. Taylor, you and Mr. Schumer, I'll recognize you, Mr. Taylor, for, for five minutes. Unless you have others out there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Reno, I'm not going to get uh, the luxury that the uh, ranking member of the chairman are going to get to summarize things, but I would like to give some observations on behalf of law enforcement. We start off with the first two witnesses who tried to portray David Koresh as just a simple country preacher who might have owned a few and sold a few guns. Well, folks, country preachers don't sleep with 10-year-olds. Country preachers don't hold people against their will for three months. Country preachers don't compile a hit list of people who disagree with them to be eliminated. I'm using his words. And country preachers don't kill law enforcement officers when you go to serve a warrant on them and wound 20 more. And in the words of an ex-Green Beret from Vietnam, outgun them to the degree that he was never outgunned by the Viet Cong. We've later heard allegation after allegation that gas killed these kids and yet no proof of it. We heard allegations of an illegal warrant and no proof of it. We heard allegations that the military was involved in this and no proof of it. As a matter of fact, what we have seen is that yes, Agent Rodriguez somehow didn't get the message strong enough to the two guys who didn't pull the plug on the raid, and I regret that, and we lost some good people, but it in no way justifies the murder of those four agents and the wounding of 20 more, and in no way justifies David Koresh holding 80 people through whatever spell he had on them as human shields. When it's all said and done, David Koresh, if he can talk husbands into giving him their wives, and if he can talk parents into giving their daughters to him, then he could have certainly talked them into walking out of that compound and going through the judicial process that you or I or Ms. Reno or anybody else in this country would ask to participate in if we're accused of a crime. Now certainly there have been some mistakes that I just outlined, but it does not justify the death of these four young men, younger than every one of us on this panel. You know, we just had a vote on the House floor by two-thirds, in fact, two-thirds of the Republican members, I have checked the Democrats, we're going to go save Bosnia because they have a lawless society, a lawless society where people are raped and murdered and the homes are stolen from them. Well, doggone it, the only thing between us and a lawless society are the law enforcement people of this country, the thin blue line that enforces the laws of this country. And they deserve the same rights that every criminal gets when they go into a courtroom, and that is the right to be presumed innocent until they're proven guilty. But unlike every single criminal that walks into a courtroom in this country, they couldn't call any witnesses. They couldn't bring in the two TV, the two tele, the, the newspaper reporters who put together a series talking about the things that I just talked about. They couldn't bring in the lady who said she was held against her will. They couldn't bring in the other one who said the Koresh had a hit list and was going to kill people. And above all, they couldn't bring in Koresh because he would not listen. And for 51 days, he would not come in. So, Ms. Reno, but I, Sorry that you have to be in the chair at the moment, but you are the top law enforcement person in the country. And the buck does stop with you. But I think it is only fair that for once this committee 
give the law enforcement people of this country the respect they do. And above all, if one message that can come out of this is, it's not right to kill a cop. I sure as hell hope there isn't some nut out there saying, gosh, if I kill somebody, Chairman Zell, the Chairman McCulloch, can they have me up to Washington? And I get to, I'll get my name all over Reader's Digest. That is not the message we need to be sending out. We need to be to show respect for law and order. There's a heck of a lot of laws that I don't like. I voted against the Brady Bill. I voted against the assault weapons ban. But they are the laws of this country, and we have to abide by them. And with that, I want to thank the chairman. Thank you for being with us, Mr. Governor. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Uh, Mr. Shattuck, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I may well not take it all. Um, Madam Attorney General, I want to uh, just clarify a couple of points we brought out earlier this morning in, our, in my earlier questioning. One was you indicated in response to my question about the FBI's position that they would not give the phone back, phone back unless the Davidians were willing to surrender. I asked if you knew about that and if you had known, would you have agreed with that decision? You indicated you weren't sure of the facts. Page 292 of your report reads, and I'm going to read it directly, from 949 to 954 AM, the negotiators broadcast instructions to the compound regarding efforts to reestablish telephone contact. The negotiator said the phone would be reconnected only if the Davidians clearly indicated they intended to use the phone to make surrender arrangements. So just so you know that it is in the record. The second issue I tried to go into was the now infamous, I guess, crushing of the back of the building on which I, I, I think there is great doubt because uh, Mr. Clark testified that it was an intentional crushing pursuant to the plan. The plan had said if after 48 hours they don't come out, then we will begin to systematically destroy the building. My understanding of that was that they were going to peel off the front so they could see in. Instead, six hours into the raid, they begin to crush the back of the building, the back portion of the gym. I, you have said here today that, and you've repeated it just now in response to Mr. Shabbat, that you thought that was inadvertent. And there was testimony that was inadvertent. But that is what is so frustrating to me, because the videotape which we showed in here showed the tank going back and forth numerous times, over and over and over again. And even these two still photos, one shows a portion of that roof still in place and the tank way back, and then later it shows that entire roof destroyed. It's a section far wider than the tank, so it took more than one run to do it. If you don't realize now that that wasn't an accident, I worry about the depth to which you've analyzed this incident. And I know you've said today that you intend to go further and, and investigate it some more. I urge you to do that, because the claim that it was accidental simply isn't credible. And, and I read on the plane last weekend going home, two quotes from you, when Ms., two quotes, uh, one by Mr. Jamar. When Ms. Reno approved the plan, Mr. Jamar said, she gave the FBI agents special orders that gassing must stop immediately if there were, quote, any indication of danger or harm to those children. I can't square the crushing of the back of that building with your concern about danger or harm to the children. Not only did Mr. Jamar say it, but Mr. Potts said, quote, any indication about danger or harm to those children, the rule was back off, get away, stop. I just don't understand how that squares with the crushing of the back of the building and with the conflicting testimony about how it happened. Uh, we are here to investigate what happened. Um, it seems to me it has been an important hearing for that goal. Um, it seems to me it's a tragedy when this happens. I think we had a duty to look carefully into these facts and to try to find out what happened and to see that they don't happen again because the mistakes here cost thousands uh, of hours of agony and, and in your life, I'm sure, as well as the lives of those individuals. Um, I have, I'm frustrated by the fact that we can't clarify even simple facts like this um, and uh, I hope uh, that we can learn a lot from this experiment or this hearing we just try to go into this, but I'm, I'm, I must tell you, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated by even the ability today to kind of put conclusion to some of these facts. I share your frustration when you have such a tragedy as this and you try to figure out what to do in the future to avoid the, the recurrence of it, not in an experiment, but in a thoughtful way. And what I had suggested to you, Congressman, is I didn't hear the testimony yesterday that you were concerned about and what as I said before to the chairman, we'll just review everything and consider, continue to consider just what was involved. 
I appreciate that. I, I would urge you also to look at a portion of your own report that reveals a young girl where they negotiated back and forth about her release. And Mr. Koresh said he would release her if he was allowed to talk to Mr. Rodriguez. The most riveting testimony in this entire hearing came from Mr. Rodriguez about his frustration and his inability to stop the ATF raid, which led to the death of all of these people. And the FBI said, ultimately, they would not allow him to talk to Mr. Rodriguez. They would not allow Koresh to talk to Rodriguez. And the girl, the young girl, six-year-old girl, that Koresh had agreed to release if he could simply talk to Rodriguez, <laughs> ultimately, your report says, presumably died in the fire. They couldn't identify her body. Um, I, I find that kind of negotiation inconsistent with what was clearly your goal, which was to save life. Mr. Shattuck, your time has expired. Mr. Schumer, you're recognized uh, for five minutes. Are you going to? If you'd like to respond, you always can. <laughs> Thank you very much. Again, I think it's so important as we work through the issues here that we not rely on memories, but that we understand exactly what was said, why Mr. Rodriguez couldn't be present, and we will continue to work with you on those matters. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schumer, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you. And first, I want to thank the Attorney General. I think it's been a long and grueling day, but I think you have conducted yourself, everyone will agree, with dignity and with candor. And I think every one of us is appreciative uh, for that. I guess what I'd like, I don't really have many questions, which is rare for me, but I think you've answered them all to the best of your ability. I have to say in all candor, um, not every answer makes the pain of what happened go away, and not every answer exactly in full clarity tells us what happened. And I think one of the reasons for that, very simply, and not what happened, but why it happened, is that by the time the Attorney General got into this situation, there were no good answers. There were no easy answers. Four ATF agents had died, others had died, and there was no easy way out. There was no good solution. And here, people on both sides of the panel are groping for that sort of little crystal out there that says, aha, everything that was done was done well and perfectly, and there was no alternative. We can't find that. Or contrary-wise, gee, this was, here's exactly what went wrong, and we won't do it again. And uh, that's not terribly satisfying at the end of the day. In fact, uh, it's in a way frustrating. But I think that given the circumstances, not being a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday, Thursday or Friday morning quarterback, Attorney General, you've certainly impressed me with the intelligence the honesty and the compassion with which you approach the problem, and uh, I dare say that any one of us could not have done any better, even though the outcome was not what we wanted. So what I'd like to do before yielding to Ms. Jackson Lee the rest of my time is ask you, is there anything else that you would like to say at the end of this long and grueling day where You've done very well, not only for yourself, but for the law enforcement men and women that you represent. I appreciate that opportunity, and I think what I'd like to say is that law enforcement is the most difficult job there is. They've got to make decisions that other people go to law school and sit at desk and work in libraries to, to find the answer to, and they've got to make it right then and there. They've got to consider human life and they do it day in and day out. And in the course of it, whether it's a police officer on the streets of an urban area, a deputy sheriff, a federal agent, they are again and again exposed to terrible danger. And they have got to risk their lives, as FBI agents did here, to save people. They've also got to make sure that the rights of this nation are protected. It is a challenging, it is a wonderful profession, but it is a profession that is so fraught with difficulties, so fraught with challenges. I am so encouraged by what I see around this country. When I go to a community policing event, I see people, police officers, relating to their community, working together. It is police officers who are bringing people together in South 
Dallas, I stood there as a young woman said for the first time she was trusting a police officer. I see FBI agents, DEA agents, ATF agents working together, working with the community, working with lo local law enforcement. I see so many good things happening as a result of law enforcement agents who care desperately about their community and the well-being of all their people. I've enjoyed the opportunity today to get to know Chairman Zeliff better. And what I think we need to do is to learn what we did here today, that if we talk together and work together and put aside tensions and feelings, sometimes we come up with a better understanding. That's what good and thoughtful law enforcement is doing throughout this nation, and I look forward to working with all members of the subcommittees to continue to do that here in Washington. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Jackson Lee, do you? The time has expired, but Ms. Expired. Jackson Lee has one question. We'll let her ask it. I do, Mr. Chairman. I thank uh, Mr. Schumann. I thank the Chairman. I thank Mr. Schumer as well for his questions on Governor Richards and providing that information probably on an informational basis. But there was quite a, an active exchange just a while back uh, on the questioning dealing with the CS gas, then something that has been uh, permeating uh, all of those who question what happened about whether we should have waited. Do you have in your review any uh, evidence, uh, or did you look at any evidence, meaning the autopsies or anything that might have given you a conclusive understanding or assessment that from the period of about 11.30 to the time the fire started and the CS gas had been in for a period of time, that individuals were immobilized, including the women and children, such that more could not have come out. Is there anything that you might have reviewed? Because the fire started 12-ish, the hits and the break-in started about 11.30, and some people did escape. Do you have anything that tells us the that the CS gas immobilized and suffocated any of those We have babies nothing and, that and tells women? us that. We have, I can't I mean, we have that again, nothing I that tells you. us that. We have information to the contrary. One of the agents who went in to, to save the life of the woman who went back in said he had no, there was no gas in there. You had information, I believe testimony, uh, here from one of those people that had been in the compound that the gas would be blown out immediately. There is no information whatsoever from those that came out or otherwise, that anybody was immobilized by the gas. But you would study definitely the use of such gas at any time ever again in, his, in your tenure? What we will continue to do is to study the CS gas, how it is used. As I indicated earlier, law enforcement has used it as a very appropriate means to resolving matters without lethal force and to resolving it peacefully. And we will continue to do that and continue to strive to develop as much technology as possible that will permit us to resolve issues such as this safely for all concerned. Ms. Jackson Lee, the time has Thank expired. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Heineman, I believe you're the last questioner we have. Uh, five minutes, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm motivated now to answer my colleague from Mississippi on the other side relative to relative to law enforcement respect, but I won't get into that. I will continue to keep this on the high road. I don't believe we need to get into politics and we're talking about such important issues. Um, but uh, I, I don't think we're fooling law enforcement. I've been in the business 38 years and I've got a kid in the business. We know who our friends are. We know who the talkers are and who the doers are. We know who votes for the exclusionary rule to support law enforcement and those that attack it. But I'm happy about these hearings. I think you, Mrs. Attorney General, performed very well today. And you've cleared up in my mind questions I had about where you stood on these issues. And I may have taken an, an unfair swipe at you in this, in this chamber at some point in the past, and I apologize for that. And I, I, at this time, would like to yield the balance of my time to the, uh, to the co-chairman, Mr. McCullum. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Heineman. I understand, Mr. Michael, you have a 30-second request. I yield to you for that purpose. Just uh, one point. Uh, the Attorney General had testified here this afternoon that she wasn't sure whether Dr. Salem was aware whether this was CS gas or had mentioned it or CN gas. 
on page one of the GAO report, it starts at the bottom of the, of the page. According to U.S. and Israeli sources, only one kind of tear gas known as CS tear gas has been used by the IDF in the occupied uh, territories. And I wanted that to be part of the record. So thank, thank you, thank Mr. Micah. Let me uh, ask just two quick questions. I think we need clarification on, uh, Madam Attorney General. Uh, first of all, yesterday, uh, Secretary Holmes, Ambassador Holmes, testified that at the invitation of the FBI's hostage rescue team, uh, two uh, British Special Air Service personnel were on the scene during the siege. Can you clarify for us, do you know why they were there? We never, he said he couldn't testify to that because he didn't invite them. The military didn't I, invite them. I don't them. know the circumstances, sir. I, I, I don't know the issue. I'll be happy well, to provide If you, you would. I just wanted to be sure we didn't go away and have 50 people calling the office saying, you never clarified that question. My understanding is they were not actively engaged. They were only there as observers, but it would be great for the record if you would give us that information. Secondly, uh, yesterday I had occasion to question some folks about a memorandum uh, from Park Dietz, a Ph.D., one of the consultants that you had, and I just want to clarify this with you as well. I'm not going to give you the whole memory. Well, you, somebody is giving it to you, but I don't care about the basic thrust of it. It was a April 17th one to Jim Wright, and he, uh, Dietz is giving a whole list of reasons what he th thought went wrong, why uh, he didn't believe the negotiations in good faith would resolve the situation, and essentially corroborating your position. But at the end of it, there were two disturbing conclusions he reached. He said, uh, if everything continues as it's been going, I expect the following. And he lists several things. The last two I want you to clarify for us. Uh, the last two are, he says, the authority of the FBI and all of its operations will continue to weaken, and the press will focus increasingly on the cost of the operation and begin asking questions about the White House role in the operation, how the expense can be justified, and whether the situation might have called for a more courageous approach. This was part of your briefing package in the big briefing book I read over the weekend. Uh, can you assure us uh, that neither one of these latter two uh, were factors influencing your decision uh, to authorize the gas? Yes, because I saw Park Dietz's memorandum as I made the final decision that Saturday. And one of the things that was key to me, I've already mentioned in previous testimony, that cost, I didn't want the cost involved to be an issue. Human life was too important. I, I, I didn't want to address that issue. Nobody in the FBI talked about weakening the authority, but again, people would see me, don't let them get away with this. That was not the issue. The issue was how did we bring the people out, the children specifically out, safely without them being hurt, and that was what motivated me at every step of the way. Well, I have concluded my questioning. You have certainly answered all the questions of this panel to a great extent through two rounds today, uh, and uh, I will know that you and I will see each other in other forums numerous times, I presume, over the next few months. One of those will be hearings that we will conduct in the fall on the question of reauthorizing all of federal law enforcement. I'm looking forward to those. I know that your contribution will be very important to that, as were these hearings today and throughout the past uh, nine days. And I would welcome you if you wish to stay. We are going now to have three closing statements to all of these hearings, one by Mr. Zeliff, one by Mr. Schumer, and one by myself. But you're not required to stay. You've been here a long time today. That is your choice. You may either sit through these closing statements or you may choose to to go back home or back to the office, whatever the case may be. I should go back to the office if, if, if it wouldn't be a problem. No, it would not be a problem. Again, thank you very thank much you. for being with us today. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, yes. I had asked uh, whether we would have uh, unanimous consent that members of this committee could submit both an opening and a closing statement for the record. Um, and uh, if there was a time period to do so. There is a time period of uh, no limit and for the next 30 days or so, but I would suggest that those statements be submitted by uh, early uh, September when we return from the recess. The report will be written then. Unanimous consent to do so is granted. I'd also like to ask unanimous consent that the three documents I used yesterday in questioning Mr. Jamar and Mr. Sage be admitted into evidence without objection. Hearing no objection, they are so admitted. Uh, there being no other business but the closing statements, I now turn to my co-chairman, uh, Mr. Zeliff. We've worked a long time through a lot of days, and uh, the floor is yours for what we've uh, agreed upon are limited uh, brief periods of time for closing today. 
Thank you, Mr. McCollum, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, too, look forward to working with the Attorney General and in, in where we go from here in terms of putting our report together. Um, the curtain now draws to a close on 10 days of oversight hearings into the executive branch conduct in the 1993 uh, events near Waco, Texas. We've heard intensive questions, emotional testimony, and thoughtful, if occasionally combative, discussion. We've heard from nearly 100 witnesses who have told their stories from their heart. Despite these efforts, the work of the two subcommittees is not over. As recently as last week, the executive branch delivered documents to us. Several witnesses raised questions which must be pursued. Further interviews must be conducted. Conflicting testimony must be addressed. The final task will be the preparation of a report which will lay out the facts as presented to Congress and answer all the questions being posed by the American people to the fullest possible extent. My goal has been and continues to be the complete presentation of the facts. This effort will continue for several months. A final report will not likely to be published before the end of the year. There are, however, several conclusions which I feel comfortable discussing today. First, the organizational structure of the federal law enforcement agencies warrant very close scrutiny by Congress. When the ATF conducted the largest law enforcement raid in our nation's history, the Treasury Secretary was out of the country attending a G7 meeting. His deputy was in Washington minding the store, but that deputy knew relative, relatively very little about what was about to occur near Waco, Texas. It is difficult to criticize the actions of Secretary Benson. After all, we hire tre Treasury secretaries to help manage the nation's economy and not to serve as the nation's chief of police. Perhaps what will come of these hearings is the con consolidation of law enforcement functions into a single department with the necessary expertise and civilian control to ensure that the job gets done right. In this instance, the ATF lost the element of surprise and continued with its raid anyway, setting up a tragic turn of events. We must continue to review and challenge the level of expertise, training, and professionalism of the nation's law enforcement officers to ensure that the mistakes of Waco are not repeated. Second, the involvement of the nation's military in domestic affairs requires further debate. It is apparent that ATF manipulated evidence to suggest the existence of a drug lab at Mont Carmel compound. The Department of Defense was required to accept the false evidence offered by the Department of Treasury and was forced to provide military equipment and training during the standoff and subsequent disaster. American tanks were turned on American citizens without the approval of anyone who was politically accountable to the American people. Unfortunately, the funds used to supply this equipment were paid for by monies devoted to our nation's drug war. Third, we must ensure that the American people can hold their nation's leaders accountable for the actions they take and the decisions they make. I am most disappointed by the dodging and weaving of the White House in the hours following the tragic ending of the Waco siege, despite assurances by his chief of staff that no significant action would be taken by the FBI without the President's approval. The first comments by the President after the fire suggested abstention and avoidance. Quote, I was aware of it. I think the Attorney General made the decision. I knew it was going to be done, but the decisions were entirely theirs, unquote. The administration's response to the Waco disaster suggests that we have come a long way since the days of Harry Truman. A sign on President Truman's desk proclaimed, and I quote, the buck stops here, unquote. Similarly, President Kennedy stepped up to the plate and accepted full responsibility for the ill-fated Bay of Pigs fiasco. In the Clinton administration, I find it is very disturbing that the Attorney General, and not the President, steps forward to state, and I quote, the buck stops with me, unquote. Now, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have argued that a day after the fire, after severe scrutiny by the nation's press corps, the president finally admitted culp culpability and responsibility. It is no wonder that the nation is so cynical. In fact, a poll released yesterday by the president's pollster, Stanley Greenberg, found that 76 percent of respondents say that they rarely trust Washington. Americans are a forgiving people, but they want their leaders to be responsible for their actions. Mr. Schumer has suggested that I would criticize the president if he was too involved and then would criticize him if he was not involved enough. I can understand why he himself has spent so many years criticizing Republican presidents the same way. But the truth is, when American tanks are used in any way on American citizens, the president must be involved and darn well should admit it. I've always believed that presidents deserve credit when things go well and responsibility when things go badly. After the Oklahoma City bombing, the President effectively marshaled the very much needed federal agencies to rush aid and comfort to the victims and to investigate the crime. The President deserved the nation's applause at that time. 
Finally, I believe these hearings have helped dispel the conspiracy theories and ugly rumors that have encircled this issue for the last two years. We have found no grand conspiracies. We have found, however, troublesome evidence of at least two powerful government agencies which had lost touch with the missions entrusted to them by the American people. Four decisions were made to conduct a military-type raid. Four decisions were made to continue the raid after the element of surprise was lost. Four decisions were made to use military tanks to destroy the compound, and four decisions were made to use tear gas against the elderly, the women, and the children. Worst of all, poor decisions were made by the civilian leadership of these agencies to monitor and oversee the powers of the federal government. While I certainly agree with those who argue that David Koresh is to blame for the loss of over 80 American lives, the series of mistakes, misjudgments, and poor decisions made by government agencies did play a role in the terrible tragedy in Waco. In the small state that I come from, people expect answers from their government. For too long and for too many in Washington, my constituents and so many Americans have not gotten straight and honest answers. In this way, people believe their government has failed them. When I ran for Congress in 1990, I ran on the issue of accountability. Accountability means standing up for what we believe, making difficult choices, and taking full responsibility for our actions and their consequences. When the credibility, effectiveness, and respect for federal law enforcement is called into question, I will stand up for law enforcement. But clearly, we must understand precisely what happened and we must review procedures to make certain that we learn from this tragedy in order that it does not happen again. I'm troubled by the administration. It seems to me that I've heard things here which I have heard before from this White House. Attorney General Reno has testified that the President was in the loop on decision making and approval. Testimony by some responsibility for, uh, by, for, by some responsible for executing the Waco raid would suggest a lack of knowledge or responsibility for the consequences of their actions. This, ladies and gentlemen, is not accountability, it is not responsibility. My constituents sent me here to get answers to difficult problems. My job is to get answers. Some of my colleagues may wish to gloss over what happened in Waco. My colleague from California actually has compared my conduct in these hearings to McCarthyism. Well, let me say simply that accountability, responsibility, and oversight are constitutional obligations of this body and something we in this government must not underestimate, dismiss, or ignore. And I want to say one very important thing, and I think it's probably the most important thing that we can say, that the, the, the tragedy of four brave ATF agents that were killed as they attempted to enter the compound, carried away by their colleagues that were also wounded during the raid, I can only imagine as the father of three sons, including a Marine, how terrible it would be to watch the video of one of my boys attempting to enter that compound window from the roof, were their lives unnecessarily taken. There is no greater friend of law enforcement than this member of Congress, and I believe every member of the law enforcement community who puts his life on the line every day would agree that for their sakes, we must learn the lessons of Waco. We must minimize the danger to our men and women who put themselves in harm's way. Their missions must be clearly defined to assure success with the absolute minimum number of casualties. Let us not forget the innocent children who died in the terrible tragedy of Waco as well. I can't begin to fathom their utter fear as tanks blasted CS tear gas into their home. Over the PA system, they would hear, this is not a raid. This is not a raid. It was probably the last thing they heard before they died. The people of New Hampshire, the people of Texas, and the people of this nation deserve from their government nothing less than a full accounting for the tragedy named Waco. Let us never forget our responsibility to the people we represent. I, for one, shall not. I believe these hearings have helped ensure that mistakes like those I mentioned will not be repeated and the wildest of conspiracy theories are without merit. For these reasons, they have been worth my time and I hope the time of each of my colleagues. I'm looking forward to working with Mrs. Reno. And finally, I would just like to say that I'm a bit small businessman from the northern part of New Hampshire in the White Mountains. Um, I believe that, that I just try to look at things. I'm not a Harvard lawyer. Um, I, I, and, and there are many very articulate people up here. I look at things from a common sense point of view. And what I have heard for 10 days, not all of it adds up. And that concerns me and distresses me. And I have a picture in my mind as I go to bed at night, looking at that picture of that tank going back in and out of that front door and with the announcement saying this is not an assault. And I just think that our government acted very improperly. And I hope, and my encouragement to Mrs. Ms. Reno would be, I hope that she takes the opportunity with, with Mr. Free to, as he, I think, is now doing, to take a good look at the FBI from top to bottom in terms of rules of engagement from their mission, 
uh, ATF ought to do the same as we are now doing with CIA. I think it's time that we just take a very, very close look. We need to hold people accountable. We need to be uh, responsive to the people we represent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad these 10 days are over. We look forward to doing something different, but I think we've done some good work for the Congress. Well, thank you, Mr. Zeloff. Mr. Chairman, yourself. Mr. Schumer, uh, you're recognized for your closing remarks. Well, I thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And um, I guess the first thing I'd say is I'd like to just talk a little bit about the fact this finishes the second phase of the hearings, first about ATF and up to the date of February 28th, and now that period up until uh, April 19th and further on. And it so happens to me the second part of these hearings has been a little less satisfying than the first part in terms of just result. I'm not saying how they were conducted or anything else. In the first part, it became pretty clear what happened. First, we had somebody like David Koresh, hardly a benign individual, somebody who was not only a lawbreaker, but in my opinion, a morally corrupt individual who used religion as sort of a shield for his own desires, for his own ability to make himself into sort of a megalomaniac who could do whatever he wanted in any way. And so that starts the conundrum. And then you have... And, and in my judgment, the idea that the ATF or any agency could just leave him alone forever is wrong. As I said earlier today, we are a nation of laws. And we shouldn't be rationalizing why lawbreakers can continue to break the law. We may want to change the law. That's what this Congress is all about. We may want to say that the law is wrong and agitate against it. But you cannot ignore that. And I'll get back to that later. But so they had to act. They didn't act well. And the blame in the first part of the hearing was fairly easy to pinpoint. Yes, we can second guess the plan, but the plan wasn't a bad plan. It's been used over and over again, not in this scope. But when the element of surprise was lost, so was the raid. It was that simple. And so the first part of the hearings was able to pinpoint something that had been pinpointed before. I think the Treasury document is an outstanding document. Early on, there were attempts to discredit it. But by the end of the first part of the hearing, people said, yeah, it's a good document. And we found very little new from that document, very little that was materially new. Some people said, well, what about the gar that, um, what about uh, the fact that there were these, the, the drug part of it, that was... That was talked about in the document and had very little material effect on the raid. In other words, that there were drugs there and brought the military in to train, not do anything else. And we found that there were here, this was more of a morality play, there were a couple of people who were, quote, bad guys, aside from Koresh, not on his level at all, but people who messed up, who should have had the sense to call off the raid when the element of surprise was broken. They didn't. The second part of the hearing is more troubling because there are no real bad guys. Someone asked Janet Reno, well, why were there no punishments the way Sarabin and Hoynotsky were punished? And, of course, the head of the ATF, Higgins, and his deputy, who was here, Hartnett, lost their jobs. Why was there no punishment? And she said, well, I couldn't punish anyone because I couldn't put my finger on who deserved to be punished, who did something wrong. Well, the raid didn't work, no question. You know, a few days ago, I compared the nitpicking on the Republican side to, you know, I said that if this committee uh, looked at D-Day, they'd court-martial Eisenhower. But the analogy was not correct. It was correct in that aspect. But it wasn't correct because Eisenhower's mission succeeded. Yes, mistakes were made, but the goal of taking the beaches and getting a foothold in Europe succeeded. This one didn't. Because the goal here was to, to rescue, to apprehend Koresh, but to rescue the innocent women and children who were there. Didn't succeed. So we know that. But no one in all the days has come up with a good answer. The only answers, you know, like some of the editorials which said, well, they should have waited it out, were based on misinformation, that there was no food and water, 
And I was amazed at sort of the common sense of one of the agents who said, of course they had plenty of water, they were doing their laundry. We could see it hanging out the day. I forget which agent did that. Okay. So this second part, I say, remains somewhat less satisfying, not because of blame, but because once there was a David Koresh, an evil man, and once the first operation was botched, there were no good answers. None at all. And it is not fair in my judgment to use uh, Monday morning quarterbacking unless you have a better answer that would have been a better answer at the time. And we've heard a lot of nitpicking again, but no one I've heard come up with a better answer. And that's sad and not satisfying because there ought to have been a better answer. In retrospect, obviously, don't do it the way you did it. And I think the Attorney General admitted that here, and I'm glad she did. But on that day, there wasn't a better answer. That's what you have to judge by if you're going to be at all fair. Well, summing up the whole, I don't want to get into all the details, but I do want to do a couple of things in terms of summing up the whole situation here, the whole hearing. First, I want to thank many different people. I want to thank both. Chairman McCollum and Chairman Zella for their procedural fairness. We did not have one procedural dispute here. That was very significant. In other words, the amount of time was apportioned fairly. At first, the witness list we were given, I thought, was all lopsided. But when we said, let us choose some of our witnesses, they said yes. And the proof positive of that is Kiri Jewell, in the most riveting testimony of the whole hearing, which I thought appropriately set the stage, because the greatest evil was Koresh, and she brought it out in simple, common sense terms was allowed as a witness. I think all of us in the minority believe that procedurally these hearings were conducted in fairness by both Chairman McCollum and Chairman Zeliff, and we thank you for that. I'd like to thank my colleagues here. We are a very disparate group. We have on this committee some of the most conservative and some of the most liberal Democrats, and then some people in between, like me. And yet, we all worked together, and we had pretty much, without getting in a room and sort of plotting, we all had about the same viewpoint. You couldn't really distinguish what Gene Taylor said from what, say, uh, Mel Watt said, except for maybe disagreement on something like the exclusionary rule, which was not relevant to what happened here directly. And so I want to thank my colleagues. And finally, on my side at least, the people I'd like to thank the most are the staff. They were just wonderful. And you know, we heard a lot of complaints on the other side. Hey, Schumer, how'd you get that document so fast? You're having an unfair advantage. Well, I'll tell you what our advantage was. I don't think it was unfair. These people back here. And I think every one of us thanks them for the hard work and diligence that they, they were totally committed to this. And we are very appreciative. I don't want to get into a detailed play-by-play play of the hearing, but I do want to talk about a few things about where we go from here, because if these hearings are going to be constructive, where do we go? Well, there are easy things. I think all of us think that we don't understand why, in the first phase, uh, why Hoynotsky and Sarabin were not punished more severely, why they were reinstated. I suppose we'll look at that. But on a bigger level, moving up a level, I heard mention we have to re-examine the structure of law enforcement. I don't see that the record examines that structural re-examination. It brings up my fears that some will use this hearing as a pretext to cripple ATF in particular. If that was an overriding concern, I would have liked a couple of questions asked of some of the people whether it should be restructured instead of just bringing it up at the end in an ad hominem way. The mistake that was made, losing the element of surprise, has nothing to do with the structure of law enforcement. Nothing. So my view is that we ought to strengthen them, they ought to learn from their mistakes, but the idea of weakening, abolishing, or folding ATF into another agency, whether it's a good idea or not, this hearing had very little, I think it's not a good idea, but this hearing had very little to say about that, and there should have been a bunch of questions if that was in the back of the minds of people. 
And then there are two other major questions that I'd just like to leave hanging out there. First, why all so, so in recent, in modern America, is there so much hatred and paranoia out there? That truly troubles me. We walked alongside that feeling in doing these hearings because of the he fear and hatred of a man like Koresh, who I have no sympathy for. But all the hundreds of people who faxed us every day, many of whom believed in conspiracy, many of whom saw the world in totally different views than we did. What is going on with those people? Why is it that so many people are so angry, some bigoted, taking their anger out in bigotry, some just coming up with conspiracies out of thin air? We can dismiss those conspiracies, and we should. And I hope this hearing does, although, as I said in my opening statement, I'm troubled that some have added fuel to the flames, those conspiratorial flames. But it still troubles me why they have need a conspiracy to sort of make their worldview complete. And how much danger do they pose to this country? And that is why I am, pr I am glad one positive result of these hearings, in the middle of them, Chairman McCollum, who has been, as I say, somebody who I think don't agree with him, on some of these issues and on some others, but he's been thoughtful and when he called for hearings on the militias, that may be one of the best outcomes of these hearings. And I just hope that they will be, I don't ask that they be 10 days, but I also hope that they don't just be three hours. Because if you look at the problem that we're floating in here, that is one and we ought to look at that. And finally, I worry after a hearing like this, not saying, not bringing up who's more pro-law enforcement or whether the questions out there were pro or anti-law enforcement, we'll leave that aside. But I worry about the paralysis of law enforcement. I've worried about it for a while. We're in a country of second guessers and we all second guess every action that is taken. Folks over at that table are excellent at that. And so are we all, because we reflect that. We do a lot of second guessing. That's your job, I don't begrudge that. But that second guessing leads to a failure to act. And we get into a vicious cycle. On the one hand, law enforcement is weaker, so the laws are less enforced, so people have less faith in law enforcement, so it gets weaker still, and the cycle goes around and around. I was struck by Henry Hyde, a man I have tremendous respect for, bringing up at the end, well, we have to understand the, these religious cults and these religious type of attitudes to better deal with it. And he almost was being sympathetic. He wasn't saying it justified their actions, but it was getting close. And I also remember my frustration when those on the left would do the same with people who are wanton murderers, saying, let's understand the horrible childhood they had. Well, I want to have understanding, but I don't want it to get in the way of keeping our nation the nation of laws that we are. And I worry about it. I worry about how difficult it is to be a cop on the beat. You're darned if you do and darned if you don't. And how difficult it is to be one of the people at that table. Now, we saw all those people and one impression I will always have is how fa of the law enforcement folks who came before us day in and day out, that they were good people. They were fine people. They were trying to do their jobs with the right blend of toughness and compassion. And I think they impressed every one of us, and I think they impressed people throughout America. They weren't jackbooted thugs, nor were they bleeding hearts just sitting there examining problems. They were fine. And what are we going to do? And how can this hearing help us make them do their job with fairness and compassion and understanding, but without paralysis and a Hamlet-like failure to act? I think that is one of the great challenges that, that we are left with here. And I believe these hearings have had their good side and their bad side, but overall, 
if instead of going off on a theory, let's cripple ATF, let's cripple FBI, but instead, how can we have better law enforcement in this country that all the people of America, even those on the extreme right and the extreme left, will believe in, then we will have made a better country. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Zellick, uh, you may. Just so that nobody walks away from here misunderstanding me, uh, and I may have not made myself clear to you, uh, when I say organizational structure, the federal law enforcement agencies, I did not say weaken ATF. And what I'm looking at is, and I, and I say it to Attorney General Reno, uh, she has an opportunity with Louis Free right now as they look at some of the changes that are going through the FBI. Take advantage of the time and what we've learned here. Let's make it better. Let's make it so that we have respect for all law enforcement. I, didn't, I did not single out eight. You did. I did not. Thank you. I just want to conclude, and I will I be... single out you. Well, and, and everybody's and singling out here. That. Nobody, I guess. But we're ready to, to wrap these hearings up, and I, I do have a few remarks I'd like to make, uh, having had the privilege of chairing today and the privilege of working with both you, Mr. Zeloff, and you, Mr. Schumer, for quite a number of days now. I'd like to make these comments. After 10 exhaustive days of hearings, though, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, February 28, 1993, raid on the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas, the 51-day Federal Bureau of Investigation siege and the CS tear gas assault of the compound on April 19, 1993, all Americans have a much better idea about what happened, what went wrong, and who was at fault for the mistakes and the loss of life. More than 90 Americans died at Mount Carmel from February 28 through April 19, 1993, including four ATF agents and at least 22 children. While it will take several weeks for the compilation of a written report of these two subcommittees, all of us who participated have begun to draw conclusions, and I think it appropriate to share a few of mine. Before I do, I feel that I should address the issue of whether these hearings have been good for law enforcement. The combined law enforcement experience of the Republican members of these joint subcommittees is remarkable. Our membership included a retired police officer, and police chief, district attorneys, an assistant state attorney general, and two federal prosecutors. I personally have spent countless hours of the past 14 years working on crime legislation that has benefited federal, state, and local law enforcement in dozens of ways. We all know that the best way to support law enforcement is to support the rule of law. When we demonstrate that none of us are above the law or beyond scrutiny, we strengthen the very institution of government, including the process by which its rules are enforced. This is why we can state without hesitation that citizens are obliged to accept peacefully the service of process of law by law enforcement and to voice their objections not through violence against officers performing their lawful duties, but through the judicial system. Now, none of this tragedy would have happened but for the diabolical actions and mindset of Vernon Howell, also known as David Koresh, and his fanaticism. The evidence portrays a depraved man who most probably deluded himself into believing he was a Messiah of God. It clearly appears Koresh captured the minds of his followers with a radical interpretation of the Bible's book of Revelation and held absolute control over them to a degree hardly matched in the annals of American history. All females in the group appear to have belonged to him to satisfy his sexual appetites and to no other males. Over some period of time, he had sexual relations with an undocumented number of underage girls as young as 10. Koresh was manipulative with everybody with whom he came in contact and always had a biblical interpretation to explain his deviant and sometimes unlawful behavior. Perhaps because of distrust of the outside world and law enforcement, or perhaps because of his religious views, which propelled him toward a violent, possibly fiery confrontation with outside authority to fulfill his destiny, Koresh amassed a huge cache of weapons. A sizable number of these weapons were illegal under federal law. Notwithstanding any defects in supporting affidavits, the ATF no doubt had probable cause to obtain an arrest warrant for David Koresh and a search warrant for the Mount Carmel premises. ATF agents conducting the raid on February 28 acted with great courage and with honest convictions that what they were doing was right. It will never be known with absolute certainty who shot first. But it is remarkable that every single ATF agent at the scene in Texas Ranger interviews stated the firm conviction that the first shots came from inside the Davidian compound. I personally am convinced that this was the case and believe that any reasonable person listening to all of the testimony we heard would come to the same conclusion. However, none of this excuses the incredible mistakes by the ATF raid planners 
the raid commanders, and those overseeing the ATF and the Treasury in Washington. There's plenty of blame to go around. The raid plan was flawed in concept. The ATF should have taken whatever time was necessary to arrest Koresh away from the Davidian compound and then proceeded to attempt a less confrontational approach. Evidence is clear that from the top on down, ATF abandoned any idea of arresting Koresh anyway away from the compound at least 10 days or two weeks prior to the February 28 raid. This was a tactical decision that had nothing to do with how often Koresh came out or whether he could be lured out. ATF officials decided that it would be preferable to make a dynamic entry to search the premises with Koresh present. This decision lacked common sense, was based on flawed intelligence, and demonstrated the ATF's lack of appreciation of the beliefs and tenets of the Davidians and Koresh's hold on them. Additionally, there was no compelling reason for the ATF's sense of urgency that drove the raid to be conducted on February 28, as opposed to two weeks, a month, or even later. Furthermore, any real appreciation for the religious tenets and group dynamic of the Davidians would have alerted ATF to the fact that the type of assault they conducted on February 28 played into the prophecies of Koresh and the fears of his followers in such a way that a violent confrontation was predictable. I might note that early ATF abandonment of capturing Koresh outside the compound before the raid is a critical new fact revealed for the first time during these hearings. The undercover operation was amateurish. Intelligence was very poor. ATF really never knew enough about what was going on inside the compound to make many of the judgment calls that were being made. It is unforgivable that all the videos and still photographs taken from the undercover house were never reviewed by the key planners and decision makers. The plan was never reduced to writing. As it turns out, command and control was sorely lacking. No one in Washington, either in ATF or Treasury, insisted on a written plan to review. Everyone up top seemed to assume that if surprise or secrecy was lost, the raid would not go forward. But there was no written plan containing this, nor was there any explicit instruction from Treasury officials or ATF Director Higgins or Deputy Director Hartnett to the raid commanders not to proceed if surprise or secrecy were lost. It appears that a primary reason the dynamic entry route was chosen was because ATF did not have the experienced negotiators or capability of conducting a siege of any significant duration. This fact was ignored in the Treasury report and glossed over by ATF witnesses. A bad siege experience in the mind of ATF agent Buford in Arkansas seems to have made him determined to avoid a siege, and because he was the seasoned agent involved in the planning, others deferred to his views and embraced the dynamic entry approach. No thought appears to have been given to seeking assistance from the FBI before the raid. If the TV cameraman had not tipped the Davidian mailman the morning of the raid, the element of surprise would not have been lost. No doubt the press should have acted more responsibly, but it should have been obvious to ATF officials that they were putting surprise at risk when they laid their cards to the officials of the local newspaper and even ATF's own public relations agent called two television stations the day before the raid and said words that conveyed the impression something was going to take place very soon. Then, of course, one cannot understate the tragic mistake of officers Sarabin and Honoski in disregarding the frantic warning of undercover agent Rodriguez the morning of the raid that the ATF's cover had been blown and the element of surprise lost. Despite their denials during the hearings, the evidence clearly points to their understanding of Rodriguez's warning at the time he gave it. The failure of Secretary of the Treasury Lloyd Benson and his Deputy Secretary Roger Altman to meet with ATF Director Higgins at all during the 30 days or so he had, they had been in office preceding this raid cannot go unmentioned. If a normally routine meeting that the head of a department would have had with one of his top law enforcement agency heads in the first couple of days after assuming office had been conducted by Secretary Benson or Deputy Secretary Altman, there is a good probability that Higgins would have been asked to reveal any important active ATF cases, and surely the Waco case would have come up. If that had happened, the Treasury officials would have had more than 48 hours to react to the raid proposal. One can't help but believe a more thorough review by Treasury officials superior to the ATF would have kept some of the tragic mistakes that led to this raid from happening. In general, the Treasury Department response after the raid was positive and constructive. The detailed investigation and Treasury report were reasonably good, but not as perfect as Under Secretary of Treasury for Law Enforcement Ron Noble wanted us to believe. Clearly, Noble and some others at Treasury tried to distance Treasury officials and the new administration from the decision-making process and any blame. 
Mr. Noble's comments on 60 Minutes that ATF agents had been directed by Treasury not to proceed if the element of surprise was lost simply was not the case. In testimony, Noble admitted that no one was ever explicitly directed in this fashion. Now, the conduct of the FBI in the 51-day siege and the CS gas assault is a different matter. In my opinion, while mistakes were made that came out of these hearings that have not been admitted by the FBI or the Justice Department, none of them rise to the gravamen of the errors of the ATF with the Treasury Department. Institutional pride appears to have caused the FBI to dismiss any idea of calling on local law enforcement to assist in the negotiations or in the tactical response. While the operation of some technical equipment and the general direction of the on-site operation of the siege may have required FBI personnel, there was no compelling reason given not to have considered the use of local SWAT teams to maintain the perimeter should the hostage rescue team have needed to stand down to refresh perishable skills had the siege lasted longer. Also, the FBI negotiators did not appear to recognize the potential benefit of using religious experts in working with Koresh and did not give any weight whatsoever to the efforts of Koresh's attorney in the final days to draw Koresh out by appealing to his desire to be the messenger of God rather than a martyr. The attorney testified he believed Koresh would have come out in 10 days or so. Despite statements to the contrary at the hearings, it was clear that all on-site key FBI personnel had concluded that the negotiations were at an impasse and that Koresh was a liar would never come out well before Koresh's attorney presented what he believed to be a breakthrough with Koresh on the 14th of April. Had the FBI tactical commander of the operation Jeffrey Jamar and the chief on-site negotiator Byron Sage not been so absolute in their mindset, they might have more generously projected the state of these negotiations to the Justice Department and Attorney General Reno during the three or four days immediately prior to the gas assault. In a memorandum dated April 15, 1993, to the director of the FBI, Dr. Murray Myron, a consultant hired by the FBI in describing his feelings about Koresh's writings to interpret the seven seals, which were integral to the final few days of negotiations, stated, I quote, it is apparent that the muse is upon him and that he is feverishly working on his manuscript. He can be expected to value these writings in the highest regard. Their publication dissemination could be a powerful negotiating tool, unquote. Sage and Jamar say they never believed Koresh was really working on these manuscripts and that it was all a ploy to stall for time. While Myron shared the view that Koresh would use the writings of his interpretation of the seals to delay coming out, he clearly thought that Koresh was working on them, would eventually produce them, and this could be the negotiation tool to get him out. Had the FBI officials taken this matter more seriously, had the Attorney General been given a more objective flavor of the negotiations, and had the Attorney General talked directly to the negotiators and Koresh's attorney, the CS gas assault might not have been approved by the Attorney General Janet Reno, at least for a few more days. There is no evidence to substantiate the concern of Jamar and others in the FBI that there was a danger in delaying the implementation of the CS gas plan for a few more days or even weeks. Mr. Rogers, head of the hostage rescue team, said that the HRT could remain deployed for at least two more weeks. The FBI apparently believed that Koresh not only would never come out voluntarily, but that he was determined to have a violent confrontation. Consequently, they concluded that with each passing day, the chances grew greater that Koresh would choose to attempt to come out in some violent manner, which might endanger FBI agents and the children. While it was certainly plausible to consider this scenario, the idea that his taking such action was imminent on April 19 is not supported by the facts. The fact that one Davidian who came out said Koresh had considered a plan to come out with explosives wrapped around him on March the 2nd does not justify the conclusion that 49 days later, with no intervening evidence of Koresh planning any voluntary violent exit, waiting a few days or even weeks longer would produce this result. Somehow they rationalized their actions by concluding that time was on Koresh's side, while most law enforcement with experience would indicate time was on the side of the FBI. Lastly, all involved should have recognized the probability that the Davidians would open fire when the vehicles approached to insert the gas, and that the type of violent confrontation this would present would play into the hands of Koresh's religious prophecies and interpretations of the Book of Revelation. 
Since the gas insertion plan called for a rapid acceleration if vehicles were fired upon, it would seem obvious to everybody that this was going to happen. It would seem equally obvious that it was a good probability under those circumstances that Davidians in the compound would not bring their children out during such a confrontation. Consequently, this plan was a very high-risk, aggressive plan from its inception. If the FBI did not recognize this fact, they should be faulted for failing to do so. If they did recognize it and did not adequately apprise the Attorney General, they are certainly to be faulted for that. Perhaps a high-risk, aggressive tactic to end the siege would have been necessary at some point, but it should have been recognized for what it was and judged on the basis by all concerned. Now comes the question of whether Attorney General Janet Reno acted as a reasonably prudent man or woman would have done under the circumstances in allowing the CS gas assault to take place on April 19, 1993. It is clear that everyone at the FBI badly wanted this plan approved and pressed very hard over a considerable period of time to get the go-ahead. To her credit, Attorney General Reno resisted for some period of time asking many of the questions that most would have expected her to ask and consistently got answers that reinforced the contention of the FBI that this was the only responsible thing to do. Because of this, it would be easy to conclude that despite the tragic consequences, she acted in a reasonable manner in approving the assault. However, it is not that simple. Faced with the critical question of whether there was an impasse in the negotiations, would a reasonably prudent person having to make the CS gas decision have immersed herself personally in determining the status of these negotiations rather than accepting the characterization given her by the Justice Department and FBI officials she assigned to talk with Chief Negotiator Byron Sage. One can only wonder how different it might have been had Attorney General Reno personally talked with Sage, Jamar, and David Koresh's attorney and gotten the full flavor for herself of what was or wasn't happening in the last days before the assault. Then one must ask why the Attorney General would have believed that the Davidians wouldn't open fire on the approaching vehicles to insert the gas, thereby accelerating the insertion of the gas and creating a confrontational environment likely to lead to a total failure of the plan. And from her testimony, she apparently assumed it was likely the Davidians would open fire, as in fact they did. Then one has to ask, why should she have assumed that the people inside would act like reasonable people when the gas insertion occurred, rather than like the followers of David Koresh, whom they were? Had Attorney General Reno fully appreciated the nature of the people in the compound and their religious tenets and total subservience to Koresh, surely she would have concluded that it would have been unlikely they would respond to this CS gas assault by simply bringing the children out. She would have seen it far more likely that the women would huddle the children together in a dark corner, pray, and try to outlast the attack, or just consider it all their destiny and perhaps their salvation to die there together. Were there solid reasons for the Attorney General to force the resolution of the siege on April 19 rather than waiting a few more days or a few more weeks? While the FBI certainly presented it that way to her, each of the primary reasons given fails at close examination. As has already been discussed, there is no evidence to support the concerns expressed by the FBI that there was any imminent likelihood of Koresh initiating an unprovoked, violent confrontation. While there was some concern over the hostage rescue team fatigue, they could have lasted at least a week or two longer, while, and while not the perfect solution, local law enforcement could have backed them up during such a standout. Conditions inside were not good, but there is no evidence that the health of the occupants was in any immediate danger, or that child abuse was any greater during the siege than it had been over a considerable period of time prior to the February 28 raid. There was considerable question as to whether negotiations were truly at an impasse which the Attorney General could have discovered had she taken the time to personally immerse herself in this question. In short, the American public has every reason to wonder whether this tragic result would have happened if Attorney General Reno had followed her initial instincts and taken the time to let this siege play itself out at least a few days longer. In the end, the same decision on the CS gas plan might have been made, and the same result might have occurred. In my judgment, under the circumstances, the prudent thing would have been for the Attorney General to have delayed the carrying out of the plan at least long enough to have personally talked with all the key players at Waco involved in the negotiations and the standoff. 
She did not do this. It should be noted that the FBI did nothing sinister, and their agents performed for the most part in the usual outstanding manner we have come to expect from the FBI. We'll never know why the fires were started, or, excuse me, the evidence is overwhelming that the fire was started inside the compound by some Davidians. We'll never know why the fires were started or who inside the compound started them or why some of the evidence is missing. I, for one, am convinced there was no conspiracy or plot and that what mistakes were made by the FBI are attributable to the failures of human nature that one might expect from extreme stress of these circumstances. Surely these hearings have accomplished much of what was intended. The American public has been given the opportunity to thoroughly review the details of what happened at Waco, and an assessment has been made by congressional oversight of the actions which took place and the mistakes which were made. In the fall, the Crime Subcommittee, of which I chair, will undertake hearings on the reauthorization of much of federal law enforcement, including the FBI and the ATF. Knowledge learned from these hearings will be invaluable in these considerations. Now, I have taken a considerable amount of time to close, and I appreciate the indulgence of my colleagues, but after you've done 10 days of hearings, and after we've been through all we've been through, I think all three of us understandably wanted to express our own personal views. Let me state in conclusion that this is not the report of the committee. The committees will get together. There will be a written report issued in the fall. The minority will be given the opportunity to comment on that report. Perhaps there will be corrections changed or or details made available that were different before, and they, they will be given the opportunity, should they still dissent from the report, to issue a written comment. But at least these are a few thoughts that I have about the details of what went wrong and what we discovered and what we learned over the past several days. Again, I want to thank my colleagues for their indulgence, not only in regard to this close that each of us made, but also with regard to all of these days of hearings. You've been very remarkable. All the staff have been very good about it. And yes, the media, too, has been patient with all of us. And we appreciate greatly the opportunity that we've had, uh, Mr. Zeloff and I in particular, sharing this job of chairing this, to present to the American public a thorough analysis of what happened at Waco and what went wrong and maybe a lot better insight. And at the end of the day today, I hope and I believe that federal law enforcement going forward henceforth will have more credibility and maybe we'll be able to put a lot of the conspiracy theories and the other problems with Waco behind us. The hearings are now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. the length of House floor sessions, C-SPAN has not been able to air all the Waco hearings in their entirety. We plan to show all the House Waco hearings in their entirety next month during the Congressional summer recess. We also plan to show all Senate Whitewater hearings again in their entirety. We'll air the hearings.